Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. You're all mic'd up. Yes. Okay, so uh, welcome to this afternoon's seminar. It's my pleasure to welcome Yoki Matsuoka from Carnegie Mellon University, who uh, works a lot in the areas of robotics and human computer interfaces. And she'll be telling us about some of her work at CMU. Okay, thanks, Rick. Okay, so, um, well, now that I've talked to some of you guys, I'm really excited um, and I will like to, I mean, I. I would like to at least frame my work in terms of HCI today, and the title at least is the hum Understanding Human Movements to Enhance HCI Environments. Um, I'm, just to give you a little bit of background of who I am, I um, was initially a tennis player. <laughs> I, started out, I started out just purely pursuing tennis, nothing else. I cared very little about school. I went to junior, uh, junior Wimbledon and everything, and I thought I was going to be a pro, went to college for tennis. Then I kept injuring my son. Eventually, I realized, well, maybe I should do something else besides tennis, just in case. Then I thought, well, the best thing might be to try to build a robot that can play tennis with me. So I have to build a robot. So I was at Berkeley, and I approached some engineering professors and said, can I you know, join your lab so I can build a robot that can play tennis with me? And they just laughed and said, OK, well, join my lab, but you know, don't think that you can do this in five years. So that's how I started in robotics. I went to MIT, built a um, humanoid robot, still thinking like maybe I can build something close to it. Um, I worked with this guy named Rodney Brooks, and then he had a humanoid robot. And he said, well, which body part would you like to work on? And I thought, well, tennis, it's the arms. So I thought arms and hands. And he said, OK, go ahead and work on it. As I started working on that, I realized that it's, you know, we really have to understand more and more about humans, really to even be able to build something that intelligent or something that complex. So for my PhD, I ended up crossing over to neuroscience and worked with this guy named Emilio Bizzi. And um, he really cares about how the human brain controls this complicated device. And that's really what I ended up doing. And how we end up generalizing movements is specifically what, my, or what I worked on in terms of PhD. So you know, in computer program, we specifically tell some trajectory. But humans, we actually repeat, say, tennis movement. The ball doesn't come in exactly the same spot. Isn't that amazing that we can sort of generalize the information that we learn and be able to hit a variety of different tennis balls that bounces towards you? So that was where I started. But now what I do is to integrate this neuroscience and robotics background together, and then really specifically to understand people and to help people. So I started a lab called a neurobotics lab. Neurobotics is the word itself is an integration between neuroscience and robotics. So that's what I do. And the goal is to understand human neural um, control of movement, so really understanding the brain, all the way to really assisting monitoring, rehabilitating people who seem to need it the most, you know, motor impaired people. So if they're missing some control component, can we actually just provide extra bit that, you know, most of the normal people have by technology? And elderly people who are starting to lose some, maybe we can sort of augment that. And even athletes. So, you know, athletes, of course, always want to have more. And maybe we also all want more. So even if they're not missing something, can we enhance even further about what we do? So that's the general idea. Um, and of course, these are sort of the, this slide actually almost summarizes a lot of the things I do. So there are two main themes that I seem to have. One is understanding humans with robots. So let me just tell you, starting from this corner, I don't know if I'm, am I, am I allowed to move around? OK. Let me, my so I use the pointer. OK, so this project. The general idea of the, how I use the robot is that I use um, haptic robotic device, so meaning that they're a robotic device that you can grab onto the end and then you can feel things around. The robot records precise movements that you make, and in addition, the robot can apply forces. So it can apply some perturbations away from your normal movement, and then depending on how you react to that, we can study what the brain was intending to do and so forth. It's called psychophysics. And that's something that we do quite a lot of. And that was what my, pretty much my whole PhD was all about. Um, 
another way that we can use robotic device to really understand more about the human brain is to specifically apply perturbations to the fingers or to the limbs. And then watching, the, you know, just, sort of just like what I said with the robotic device, but then now with the system ID, we really model the human limb more like a spring and damper and mass, for example. So it's a mechanical device. It really is to a certain extent. And so it turned out things like spring constant, we um, vary that with the brain signal. So you imagine going on a ski slope for the very first time and you're really rigid. You know, you're like a big spring that's with a very high K. You know, and then you're going down the hill, but eventually as you get better and better at it, your spring constant is dropping over time. People can intuitively know that we can tell this to a high school student, they'll say, yeah, yeah, we're like a spring, a really stiff spring to really, really flexible spring. But there are no real technology or techniques out there which really can record those changes over time and then characterize them and talk about them and maybe use it even to help people. So that's sort of one of the things that I do in System ID. I'll get into it in a little bit. And finally, I really do work with monkeys. Um, we don't have monkeys in my lab. They're a little bit too cute for me to really work with directly. But um, I work with people, physiologists, who have monkeys who have chronic implants in the brain. And they record the brain signals for us. And then we build robotic devices, which uses those signals to really control and, and the prosthetic controls. Um, so by actually using the brain signal and then how do we really interpret it and then how do we really talk about joint angles and then be able to even, you know, initially going with the arm but eventually moving different fingers, manipulating objects, how do we really go about that? Can we really do that? Can we eventually really do that for people? That's an interesting area and it's really more about understanding human movements at this point than to really assist because it's in a very primitive state. Um, now, so besides understanding, and this is sort of what I like to say. I think I told Destiny about this a little bit. But um, you know, I love understanding human brain. But if I spend all my life really trying to understand human brain so that one day you know, I might be able to help people, well, I'm going to be dead a long time. You know, maybe like in 300 years, maybe finally we understand the brain just enough so that maybe we can start to build devices. But I, I want to do it. You know, I, I don't plan on living for 300 years, well, at least for now. So from that point of view, I thought, well, maybe there are things that we can start using. Maybe there are you know, robotic devices that we can use to start assisting now. Sure, we don't understand everything, but that's OK. Let's start doing that. So uh, the other half of my lab, we really focus on assisting people. Um, this is a focus using haptic device. Again, this is the robotic device that can, for example, go on a tabletop. And it applies force feedback in just the right way to rehabilitate people. I'll go into that in a little bit. Another idea is a wearable device. Um, I work with exoskeleton, so we call it. So instead of a tabletop device that you can detach yourself to, that you just wear and maybe you can, um, if you had a spinal cord injury, for example, um, you can take some of your signals and then use it as an input to the robotic device. And finally, this is sort of the, my pet project. This is probably least related to HCI, so we don't talk as much about it. But for those of you who are interested, I can tell you more about it someday. But um, this is a, my prosthetics project. Um, and I have a big problem with the current technology of prosthetics, that what people wear now are either claws or even you know, a hook or something that looks aesthetically correct but doesn't do anything. And there are reasons for that. There are, People like to be so, uh, you know, sort of blend into everybody else, don't want to look sort of weird. So if you start to really think of that, then everything else that might provide that much um, sort of the norm normality is too heavy to really have you know, working right now. So well, can we really push that envelope? How much can we really push for that? And then we are really working on that right now. So we're at the point where we can build an index finger, which the control mimics exactly and precisely the way our muscles are connected. So our motors, um, basically the force input to those motors mimic exactly the force input to human muscles. And it's working pretty well. So that's kind of the general idea. I use this slide often in my overall lab um, 
presentation saying, well, we really in, try to integrate human and robots. Robot is kind of like a part of human body. Human was almost kind of like a part of a robot. And by really start talking about the closed loop interaction, there are a lot of applications like sports um, training to um, stroke rehabilitations to even, again, enhancing um, the inherent ability. So I thought, hey, for Microsoft, why don't we do this? You know, this is very similar, but we can sort of slice my work in, slightly, in again, different point of view, but the technology and the modeling and the software, whatever, the, the fundamental idea is still the same. But now we can talk about things like enhancing the environment, video games, or, you know, HCI, specific accessibility for disabled, or, you know, one day just really talk about really controlling devices from the brain. This is a pretty interesting one I'll get into. Keyboards, maybe, wouldn't that be great if we had some keyboards by typing and it will tell you you are about to get injured, you know, slow down or go and get, get a coffee. So that would be kind of a neat concept. Okay, so the way I'm going to do it is that I'm going to introduce you different project and um, I'm going to tell you the title you might like to hear and then a title that I might normally use. Okay, so, um, and a lot of them are somehow a lot to do with the virtual environments and video games. And then you can, you know, think of it in whatever the way that you think is most appropriate in your head, as long as they excite you. Great, that's really what I'm after. Okay, so the first one, I've been advised by my husband, said that you guys would be most interested in this project, so you have to put those slides in the very first one. So that's what I did. This is the, specifically the sports training um, an elderly assistant with wearable wireless sensors. And specifically, I have been addressing the sports training issues. Um, since I moved to Pittsburgh, I've been awfully depressed about not being able to go snowboarding or play tennis um, or go surfing. So I thought, well, I have to pick up a sport, and I picked up golf, and boy, it's fun. I got really, really addicted to it. Um, now, this is actually me playing in the, spring, um, the Palm Springs. But, um, so. Um, now what I would love to do is to be able to record myself going out there and you know, playing and what if I made the greatest shot of my life? Well, there's no way to replay it, right? And what if you made an awesome shot or what if you made a horrible shot? Regardless, I like to know how, what I did and what I did right or what I did wrong. Now, these days the way people analyze movements is to bring, say, athletes into the lab environments and let's put markers um, like this, right? So this is what you normally see for sports players. Say, so, okay, let's come in and let's, you know, change you into this tight clothes and we're going to put 40 sensors and, you know, try to imagine you're under pressure and now let's swing. But they can't ever recreate what, they ha what happens in the real life. So we thought, well, really the motivation is to produce some sensors that are completely wireless, completely wearable, portable. They could be anywhere miles away from whatever the computer, computational source. No cameras, no umbrellas full of cameras. And uh, this is where um, I started developing a watch-like wearable sensor. So these sensors, as you can imagine, have sort of an accelerometer, gyro, um, magnetometer combinations. And the whole hardware is pretty simple. That's combined with a you know, PIC uh, microprocessor with the battery power. Um, as small as possible, you know, every year undergrads come and try to make it a little bit smaller and so forth. And um, then industrial designers make it look really nice. Now, we can strap those things on people and we can start tracking people. Now, this is sort of the, uh, the latest of how much we can really track people. This is the laptop is 180 meters away, 180 feet away. And the fidelity is very good. And this is kind of, it's actually a pretty hard problem, so it turned out. People move sometimes very, very fast. And if you've not worked with anything like accelerometers and gyros, there are a lot of drift issues. There are a lot of averaging issues, slow up, um, updating rate. Um, what we actually do to overcome all those is what we know about human movements. So because humans make predictable movements, so it turned out, especially in the domains like in the velocity domain, so if people start moving, we can actually pretty much predict what's going to happen about 100 milliseconds later. By knowing that, we can then compensate for some of the delay problems. Um, and we can even predict the terminal position quite well, so it turned out. So golf swing, they were swinging really fast up here. 
And if we were just using simple sensors and you know, didn't really think about the algorithms and just swung, what the computer shows is the stops at halfway point because all those fast movements here got averaged into about this position. But by again looking at, say, things like velocity profiles, we can estimate exactly how far they might make it. And we can get away with that. So this is a really new. The update rates on things like accelerometers, accelerometers with uh, frequencies they work at? Uh, about 100 hertz. And that's not enough for human movements. Uh, those, you know, those, obviously those cameras that I showed you in the lab, those are working at like one kilohertz. And sometimes that's not even enough. Are, are there intrinsic limits on the MEMS or whatever in the accelerometers that limit that? Um, a variety of things. So there, we have to, one, work with a lot of sensors on the body. So that's, of course, a limiting factor. Um, another is the battery power and then the microprocessor power. and. You know, the more we have, the more power, more of everything that we need, and the size becomes an issue. So everything's sort of limiting at all times. So that's the reason for it. With that, so with that little video you just showed, how many sensors was that? The golfer? No, the guy who just like got the moving around. Uh, we actually have. I have a feeling that this. We actually had four working sensors here. Let's see. We always have one on the forelimb, one on the upper limb, and a one on the torso. So we at least know the relative position. And then we can do things like this. And obviously, we can expand it to all legs and arms. We also have a software that's pretty nice that wherever we strap it, we actually <clears throat> just click that body part and then go through some routine of calibration, just bow motion, leg lift motion, and then it can calibrate itself. So it's pretty simple. OK. Now on to the next project. Um, so I have a project which is called Rehabilitation by Distortion. OK, again, this is an environment that we see that maybe there is a lot of potential for video games. Um, just to give you a quick background on what, whenever I use the word haptic, if you're not in the field, it might be confusing. So I figured I'll quickly explain through the cartoon. Um, haptic is really providing a sense of touch. So this is a, you know, a dog who likes to bite a mailman, and they put this little metallic device, which feels like it gives a force feedback of biting a mailman. And you know, the goal is to really provide the feeling as close to the real biting as possible. So there are a lot of products out there, actually. The companies, there are companies that are selling quite a lot of those. Phantom is probably the one that's most sold. There are probably 500 units out there by now, which is really amazing. Um, and people are just doing a lot of research on it. There are two big, probably, challenges in the haptics, which is how do you produce you know, this environment that's very large and safe. Of course, you can make a tiny robot with a tiny workspace, and then you can interact with their finger, or you know, maybe high fidelity system, which only moves for a couple millimeters back and forth. But you know, if we're going to do real gaming environment, moving a lot, or even rehabilitation, we want something that's very large. And then all of a sudden, safety becomes an issue. And of course, transparency and performance is an issue. Here are a couple of typical applications right now. Here is the product design. If you had force feedback, uh, one time Ford Motor Company approached me and said, um, can you build something very large and haptic, which we can feel the shape of the car before we actually build them. People like to kind of feel how smooth they are, and then they want to have a force feedback for it. And that's one of the big application areas for this device. Another is the surgery. So of course, whenever you're doing microsurgery, all of a sudden, if you put it onto the computer, Robot can be doing the micro scale while the surgeon is doing a micro scale operation. It removes tremor and so forth. And then surgeons like to have force feedback as they're suturing some of the things. You know, as they're um, putting needles in, they want to feel how the, the tissue feels like. That's another big application area in haptics. And of course, the area that I'm interested in is the rehabilitation. And a lot of those haptic robots are indeed used for rehabilitation pretty successfully. Um, Stanford, MIT, UC Irvine, and you probably see MU are the four places that are very um, forefront of the rehabilitation of robotics. And currently, for a variety of reasons, probably FDA approval and so forth, that what's the, what the robot's used for is to take advantage of its uh, ability to go repetitive motion without fatigue. So human therapists, well, actually, here, here's what happens. If you just had a stroke and you are injured, you, you know, it's just finished the acute state. Now you sort of are half paralyzed and 
you know, have a, some ability to recover. They send you over to the Rehabilitation Institute and then you see a human therapist who moves your arm passively back and forth for the first half an hour and then they put you in a little waiting weight training machine and say, okay, lift this, hold there, hold there, hold there, okay, relax. You know, that's sort of what they do over and over. Um, so what the human therapists want to have is something, some robotic device that can automate all of this for them. Um, so that's really what all those projects are at this point. Re repetition, so a robot can move the arm back and forth without ever fatiguing, precise moment, movement recording. Um, and it has been shown that great, you know, we can improve people equally to what human therapists do. Well, that's great, but it's almost like an assembly line. It's not interesting enough. You know, we want to do something even beyond. Can we actually really sort of explore this virtual environment or robotic environment in such a way that we can go beyond what human therapists can do? And that's really where we are right now. There are actually probably two groups who are really pushing on this effort. First group is Northwestern, and another group is me. Um, the really idea is that we're providing the patients with some feedback whether it's a visual feedback or force feedback of some sort. So we have a lot of space to actually manipulate those information. And the way I'm doing it is called the rehabilitation by distortion. Here's the big picture of that concept. Okay, so, so it turned out people, the vision is very acute. We see things and we believe it far more than what we feel in our muscles. So if we close our eyes, and then if I stirred your arms around back and forth and asked you what angle your elbow is in, you can't tell really well. So it turned out you, it's really dull. And you know, if I presented it right in front of you and said how many degrees is it, and you look at it and you know it's 90 degrees, but if I close my eyes and then went somewhere else, you know, I can probably approximate it within 30 degrees, but that's about it. So I take advantage of that. So now what I do is I immerse people into a certain virtual environment where there's a display of their own arm moving around. And they can't see their own arm because they're wearing this goggle and then this sort of, it's uh, inhibited to, to uh, see their own arm. Now I start to change that, um, what they see that they're doing versus what they're actually doing slowly. And so it turned out, we can really push that to be very, very far apart. I, one of the first things I did when I um, arrived at CMU is to really characterize how big that space is, what we call the perceptual gap. Um, people, really healthy people have the perceptual gap of about 20%. It's actually a percentage rather than like a newtons or centimeters or meters, but it's kind of interesting. Within the same base, it's a, it's a percentage difference. So, for example, if um, I got you to, you know, move something across, I go by metric system, sorry, but say by one meter, and on the display, if I show that you moved it um, 100 and, uh, like 1.3 meters, that's 30% difference, you won't be able to tell the difference at all. As a matter of fact, you purely believe what you see in that certain circumstances, and then that percentage goes to about 20 to 30% for normal people. For disabled people, that can go from 50 to 100 percent. So now we have this perceptual gap between what you believe that you're doing and what you're really doing. In rehabilitation, that's very important, so it turned out, that patients often get stuck in what they believe in, and that's all they do in their normal life. So stroke patients, they you know, learn to compensate to you know, whatever that they were stuck in three months after the injuries, but they actually did recover over time physiologically. But because they learned to compensate in movements, they decided never to use their real ability. So we can actually put them in a virtual environment. We can get them to believe that what they're doing is what they have been always doing, just doing very little visually. But in order to produce that very little visually, they actually have to do more and more and more over time, and maybe more and more and more coordination. So when they actually take this goggle off, all of a sudden they have a lot more muscle strength and the coordination back. And they can actually retain this even in our daily life. And what I've shown is at least one example. This patient had a, uh, got in a car accident eight years uh, ago, and she actually had one, uh, two years of rehabilitation with a human therapist until insurance no longer covered, and she saw absolutely no improvement after those two years. She came into us six years after that, so eight years post-injury, 
and even her parents, she said, no, you know, not, nothing has improved for the, the, all this time. It's really hopeless. We actually took her, put her in a six weeks of this distorted environment. She went, just this is a finger experiment, but she went from being able to only move her index finger 40 degrees to 68 degrees in six weeks. So, like, little to quite a lot. It's 90 degrees, actually, the full range of motion. And then the comfortable maximum force went from 3 newtons to 5 newtons. That's, again, quite a lot of difference. So as you can see, just for th six weeks, this is very dramatic. And so we what was she seeing, you know, when she was early in the stage, when she was doing big, she was seeing more or less than she was doing? She was, she was seeing exactly what she was doing at the beginning. Um, so she had her normal range of motion. She saw that she hadn't gone as far as she knew she could. So she would act more. Yes, actually, it, it was even, it was just a video game. What she played was um, almost like a, a Wheel of Fortune. So they had display letters, and then she had to pick letters to guess what, you know, what the word that she's going to form. And that in order to reach all the way to the last letter, it was slowly, the mapping was changing. And then we basically said, no, mapping is not changing, and we've set it to the maximum at the first time you came to visit, and then it changed over time, and then she was able to reach further and further without her knowing. And then by the end, she was able to transfer that information to daily life. So when did you reveal to her that she'd been manipulated? At the very end. So how many participants have you tried um, We've tried this. We are on a third subject. Well, actually, we had three completed subjects. And then we're running two more right now. Every other day, so three, day, three days a week, six days, uh, six weeks total. It's two hours long, but that's from sort of coming into the lab, setting them up, and then so the actual time, and then they also take a lot of rest. They're pretty um, badly injured people. Most of the people don't even have sort of the vocal expression back yet. So everything takes a long time, and then even to say, are you comfortable, and then they have to tell us that they're comfortable. All those things take minutes at a time, so that, but the whole thing is two hours long. So again, just thinking that this whole perceptual gap idea, I've been using it for rehabilitation, but wouldn't that be interesting? Maybe we can explore something in terms of the HCI, the fact that people just sort of think whenever we say the word feedback, it has to be precisely to what's happening. But you know, maybe we can actually have all kinds of different gaps in different places, and we will know it. And maybe that's an advantage. OK, so now on to uh, talking about the safety. If we wanted to provide force feedback in a large workspace, it's very difficult to do. There are no commercial devices out there. And in rehabilitation, what we really like to do is for people to be able to do something like open a cabinet, put bread and peanut butter and jelly out of there, and then be able to make the sandwich out. And one thing we noticed that this seems like a silly thing to record, but we really reali didn't realize how large our, our motions are as we're doing this. And there are absolutely no robots that can safely allow you to do those motions right now. And this is just our little recording device. So, you know, if you imagined yourself, if I can ever stop this, maybe not. Um, if you imagined yourself um, sticking your, you know, just clamping onto a robot that might assemble robots, well, that's really scary to do. And the reason why it's scary is because those robots have motors. Motors are the scary thing. It's the active component. So we say, well, why don't we try to build a passive device instead of the actuator being the motors? Let's explore the space of brakes. You know, what we, when we say force feedback, it's the resistance. So why not brakes? Well, we immediately ran into some issues. So it turned out if we try to produce something what's you know known as a very efficient structure, it's all revolute joint mechanisms. Um, we quickly violate the lower thermodynamics. So I won't get into it too much, but. So it turned out that um, the working environment, the force feedback environment, will have holes where we cannot apply forces to people correctly. We call this the Swiss cheese environment. We just love that because they have workspace that has holes that violates the law of thermodynamics. But then we you know, mathematically figured out that as long as the robotics device has the orthogonal kinematics, meaning that x, y, z, or you know, x, y, and then the radi um, the cylindrical coordinate or you know, spherical, which is 
raw pitch and then maybe one x axis or something like that question? But we have no energy storage, so it's hard to do anything reactive. So you can only do a limited amount of force feedback, right? That's right. So it's all dissipative. So it can do it can definitely resist you, but it will not push you back in the direction that you are not going. So yeah, it definitely it doesn't uh, divert you off into different directions. But still, it still turned out you can do a lot of things like object sim sim uh, simulation. So, you know, in a virtual environment, what you want to have is say maybe you want to display a little ball that you can bounce off and you feel like you're bouncing the ball. With a conventional active robot, you approach towards a ball and then your finger or hand would go blink and then bounce off the ball. With the brake action device, you come to the ball and then and you get resisted, but people don't just bounce off. People actually keep going into the ball and then they feel like, wow, it's really resistive, and then it comes out of the ball and it starts sliding really fast. And we call this the sticky wall syndrome that we perceptually somehow, when we start to feel the higher resistance, a lot of people imagine like, oh, then people must think to move away from the resistance and go in the easier path. That's not what we do at all. We actually Whatever the you know, thing decision that we made ahead of time, we'll keep doing it. And even if it's really hard, because we're not exploring every single direction, so we don't know if any other place is better. So what we end up doing is this. So we are not able to build, like, you know, imagine nice tube of environment where we can guide people inside. Um, we can do that with the active device, but we don't seem to be able to do that easily with a brake actuated device. If the, you know, the path start turning, people just start keep going inside deeper and deeper without really knowing that there is an optimal path out there. Yep? Well, I guess because it's sticky is because your end effector is not on the end of the wrist. Your end effector is probably back at the, uh, at the source, right? With a good uh, force feedback end effector, you can get rid of the sticky part. Uh, no, not with the brake actuated device. So, well, well you, you can. So the, I'll show you that there, there are two ways to do it. One way, so on off, well on off brake clutches. We, we tried on off brakes, clutches, um, magnetic particle brakes, and uh, eddy current brakes. So all of those things is, all have this unfortunate problem. But but there are ways to go around that. So one is an axis alignment. If you really jam one of the, so you can imagine X Y Z robot. If you come to a place where all of a sudden we jam on the z-axis brake, it will feel like a plane. So there are ways that we can do it, and this that, there, that eliminates the stickiness. Another way we actually can do is, again, you know, here I'm trying to tell you that knowing human movements help, and then this is one area that, again, by knowing, as I said, as, as you know that people are approaching in a certain direction, People are very predictable, so it turned out we can again predict up to 100 to 50 to 100 milliseconds ahead of time in terms of where they're heading very accurately. By knowing that and knowing where the object they're going to contact, we can predict where the contact and sliding plane should be, and then we can quickly align the machine axis in the right way to slip people in the right direction. And another thing we take advantage of is this perceptual gap. Because people are very um, dull in that we can actually have this alignment to be not so precise and people are just fine with that. So if we're, you know, the application is in things like video games where the precision is not much of an issue. We can still slide people into some different plane similar to it and it'll be fine. What we care about is how the car surface feels like it may not work out because we can't really start feeling, fooling people into slightly different planes. But at least this is an area, again, knowing what people might do ahead of time will help out in terms of um, producing this virtual environment. OK, that's what I said. All right, so moving on to this preventing carpal tunnel syndrome. OK, now switching gear a little bit, I've talked about all those virtual environment and gaming environment and so forth. Now I'm going, and also I talked about hardware. Now I'm going to talk about more to do with the algorithms issue. And I'm specifically interested in what I said about you know, learning how to ski and why people are really tense and then all of a sudden start relaxing. Can we really quantify that? In addition, if we can quantify that, another thing we can also quantify is, for example, fatigue as people start to get tired and then start to use some repetitive movements, can we just simply observe 
some properties of the interacting limbs and be able to tell people that, hey, you're getting tired and, and you've been doing this for a while, just relax, rather than just you know, recording how long they've been doing it. So here's how we do it. So we assume human limb to be a mass spring damper type system. Very, very simple assumption that we make. Um, just say we care about the endpoint impedance. Impedance is just the MB and K, so the spring constant type, um, type terms. And then assume that this is a very simple second order linear system. If we apply some force perturbation onto the limb by watching the displacement and then calculating velocity and acceleration, we should be able to just simply calculate for those three unknowns. Okay, so apply three forces, three unknown, three equations, we should be able to figure out what this MB and K are. Okay, that's great. We can apply those three different forces if it's a in time invariant system. So if people are doing some, say, task that will, the arm parameters are not going to change or learning doesn't occur. So it's something you've already learned very well then we can apply forces you know, indefinitely so many, many, many times and then average all of that and you can still get all those parameters M, B, and K. However, and th those techniques are very well established. A lot of um, researchers from the 80s and 90s have published a, a variety of papers saying, yeah, this is very interesting to look at. This is you know, how the impedance vary, um, not vary, impedance um, specifically tuned to certain tasks and so forth. And that's really nice, but what we're really after is to observe this change over time, and again, that might tell us things like learning and fatigue. So this is what I do, and I apply some impulse-like force onto the people's limb. Specifically, I rather apply this force in a very task-specific way. So, you know, in the more of the Microsoft domain, it could be something like typing a keyboard. That's a for impulse like force perturbation applied to the limb, to the finger. Same thing, um, if you're trying to catch a ball in your hand, it's the same thing, it's an impulse like contact with an object. But there could be some other kind of forces, uh, for instance, if the, since the limb is connected to the body, uh -huh. there could be some residual forces somehow that, I mean, the force that hangs, the, you know, the palm over here, so yeah. you take into account that force. Which force? So you're talking about externally applied uh -uh. force. External yeah. force, certainly. And of course, there are, I mean, you're talking about the mass, maybe just this part. Mm -hmm. There could be some other connection. Right? It's not just isolated part. Sure. So I, I don't isolate anything. So I just assume that this, where we care about yeah, this entire thing. arm oh. or entire finger. I see. Okay. So somehow you have to make an approximation to isolate a particular part of the domain. Um, sure. So if you're typing, we assume that people are typing not like with the entire body's mass on top, but people are typing with you know the reasonable assumptions. But certainly, yeah, we can make assumptions. So for things like catching a ball, we can assume that if we tell people to catch a ball like this, they're not going to use their entire body to catch it. They're going to use their isolate and catch arm. Oh, actually, we did put a seatbelt on top of people. But so then by simply recording the applied force on the hand or finger over time, this is in milliseconds, and then having precise force sensor and precise acceler accelerometer, we can record the acceler acceleration over time, take the integration twice, and then we can get the velocity and position information we need. Now, then only thing we do is simple least square fit over those 50 milliseconds. Now we have, you know, whatever the, um, number of times that we record, say within the first 50 milliseconds, we record this at 10 kilohertz, now we have 500 data points. We do the least square fit within that 500 points. And you can see that the red solid is the recorded force, the blue is the recorded acceleration, green is the velocity, light blue is the, the position, then after this least square fit to find M, B, and K, calculate force back, that's the uh, dotted red line. We can really calculate the force back nicely with R squares 0.988 on average. That's very, very nice. When I put no mass or known spring onto the system and then trying to really see if I can guess the mass and spring correctly, those are the, the maximum errors. So, 
we can do a very good job in terms of, est of estimating mass and spring. Okay, so now talking about, you know, what kind of things can we get from people slim? So in this example, bouncing a ball, um, we actually have this ball as a virtual ball. People are interacting with a robotic device. So people are holding on to the end of a robot and then on the, virtual, on the computer screen, the ball starts to fall and then the people feel this boink, you know, the bouncing the ball feeling. People, they're told that this is the handle and the ball will fall on top of you and actually there's a tiny little dot, but that's the target and their goal is to bounce it in just the right way so that the ball ends up hiding that dot. So that's the target. Now if you did, I'm not going to explain the whole detail, but you know, you can do the equation of motion and calculation and figure out what's the precise impedance you should have in your hand to bounce that back that ball just at the right height. You know, so if you, I threw you a bowling ball and told you to bounce it up really into you know, a very high spot, you're not going to have your arm relaxed, right? You're not going to have very low impedance. You're going to have very high impedance so that you can bounce it back up. If I gave you a really, you know, those little ball that kids play with a very light bubbly bouncing ball, you don't have to have your arm really stiff. If you have your arm too stiff, you might bounce up way too high. So again, you're controlling your limb impedance to control the height that the ball bounces back up to. Okay, so that's really the task, and then we can actually theoretically calculate what that number really should be. Um, those are all the things that says, okay. So by knowing what the ball mass in the spring is, so ball being 15 grams or ball being 37 grams, or the ball having certain spring constant, 300 or 600, obviously we would have just the right answer, just, just the right arm, human arm spring constant and a damping constant that would allow you to bounce back the ball and adjust in the right target area. And I can theoretically calculate that. And now the thing is to say, can we use my impedance calculation technology and identify that people really indeed do this or not? And people do. So here's that figure that I just showed you. And this is what people ended up doing. This green area, the green circles, are the successful bounces where people were able to bounce it back up to the right target area. And the red ones are the not successful ones. So we can really calculate exactly what we predicted. We predicted ahead of time what people should do. And indeed, people used that strategy to get the correct bounce from, to the target. And whenever they didn't, they got the bouncing to be um, off the target. And we can do the same thing for target that was um, higher up. It required sort of stiffer arm to bounce it back higher. And that's exactly what people did. OK? Uh, I sim simulate the gravity in the virtual environment. Now, you know, so it's great. This whole technique seems to be working. You know, we can theoretically calculate what should happen. People seem to do it. Now, but originally I talked about what I really care about is to see the change over time. So for every bounce, you know, this is the dotted line area is the target stiffness they have to achieve. And every bounce, how do they actually evolve over time to be able to get into that right zone? Well, seems to be some learning curve that's associated with it. Lower ones that are easy, almost the first trial works out. And that's for subject, just one subject. And then when you average, you can get a nice curve. You can fit a line through. And, and you can even say, well, first time they were exposed to this high target, it took slower learning curve than the second time they were exposed to, which they learned much faster. So all of a sudden, we can characterize this learning, which is very nice. Um, let's see what the next slide says. Oh, OK, before that. OK, so here's the idea here is that one thing that we started to notice as we started to do this experiment is that if we keep recording this over and over, we actually noticed that the, this whole impedance and stiffness information went even higher. And then we started to think, well, what is that really related to? Well, as we got really tired, it seems that the human limb impedance also became higher. So for this learning curve reasons, we purposely cut the experiment before the fatigue kicked in. But if what we care about is to know when the fatigue kicks in, like for applications where we want to stop people from getting tired, 
that's exactly the thing that we should pay attention to. And that's one thing that I thought was really interesting when you're doing the EEG experiment, said that what people have considered as noise is actually something that has a lot of information in it. Same thing here. What we consider fatigue to be noise that we really didn't want to see, but hey, there are applications where we actually can care about fatigue and really record and characterize that. And I think that's very fascinating. Okay, and then carpal tunnel. So you know, maybe you guys are all expert in carpal tunnel syndrome, but carpal tunnel happens when you know the wrists are flexed, uh, sorry, extended, and then the pressure is applied within this little carpal tunnel area. And if you do repetitive motion, and then then the nerve actually get injured in here. Sometimes also if you do a lot of um, flexing jobs, so if you're carrying heavy shopping bags for a long period of time, one of the muscles called the lumbrical, um, that's sort of a muscle that's actually in here, but it can actually get inflamed and, and, and actually gets longer and longer and start to go inside a carpal tunnel itself, and that ends up squishing your nerves, and that can also carpal tunnel. So actually all those little symptoms do um, affect the human limb impedance. So I really truly believe that if we can characterize the human limb impedance, finger, limb, uh, finger impedance, through the keyboard force imp impulses, I think we can tell before the people start to get injured that they're actually overusing their fingers and it's time to stop. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Finally, the brain control devices, um, and this again is kind of my pet project, and, but I'm going to go through it really quick because uh, we're running out of time. And also, um, I, again, before I arrived here, I thought this would be the least interesting thing for you guys. So I try to cut it as short as possible. Now I know. Maybe I can tell you guys more some other time. But So this is really the, my, my pet project. I re really would love to get to a point where we can take amputated people or paralyzed people and be able to give you a robotic either limb or exoskeleton device, connect that device onto your you know, brain somehow and wireless signal, so you know, brain has something chip inside, wirelessly connected to the robotic device, and the robot can move very naturally, um, whether it's a leg or hands, especially interested in hands and arms. So, uh, since I never worked in this area, sure. do the nerves after amputation totally atrophy? Is there nothing useful between the location of amputation and the brain? It, it's very variable, unfortunately. So it all depends on what the injury was all about, where the cutoff point was. Most of the time, the nerve lives all the way to the end, and they have sensations at the end. There are some nerves that we can still pick off at the stem. And then the phenomenon of like phantom limbs. That's days. right. That's yeah. Because of those, or it's not clear where it is. Phantom limb is all up in the brain. So this is interesting. I actually have another project. I take advantage of that. But phantom limb happens when, so for example, in the brain, the face area and the hand area are right next to each other. So people whose hand got amputated, for a while, those people, you go and touch their face, and they go, oh, that really feels like you're touching my hand, even though you know, I know I don't have my hand anymore. That's because in the brain, the hand area and the face area, and the hand area is no longer connected to anything. It's a free real estate. Everybody wants to grab it, so the face area goes, ooh, ooh and then it moves over. Now face area has much more real estate that you know, used to be uh, connected to the hand. So for a while, the perceptual part is really confused. Um, some people have that only for a few weeks. Some people have it for a lifetime. So that's where the phantom limb comes from. Actually, I have a, a project called Sensor Transfer System. I do sort of reverse of that by those people who are experiencing the phantom limb. I get them to wear gloves, which you can take sens um, sensory information from people who can't feel it on the hand anymore and stimulate the same sensation back on the hand, on the face. So what they have remapped, you know, so the hand area, face area, hand no longer can feel it, face has taken over. Now with the external device, we start stimulating the hand area back with the hand information with the hope that we can reverse that a little bit. And that's something that we're also working on. But OK, so yeah, so prosthetics. Um, I show a leg prosthetics for the reason that um, 
leg prosthetics have made great advances by understanding a lot about biomechanics and also being able to understand and be able to build clever mechanical systems. Now people are running marathons with them. Their things are you know, readily available. Most people don't even notice those amputees are wearing those um, prosthetic devices. And that's really nice. And it doesn't even require a lot of intelligent controllers to do this. And I wish I can say about that, about arms and hands, but that's not the case. So, you know, those are the, probably the two m most popular um, prosthetic hands, and they look ugly. Who would think that there was a natural, you know, original hand? Nobody would. So, that's where really I, my research lie right now. And there are three big challenges. That one is to try to squish all those large degrees of freedom into the very small space and weight. Um, that's, you know, material science really has to go pretty far at this point to make it happen. But also, we need intelligent controller, not like a leg where if the body starts leaning, the next thing people do is to have the leg swinging forward. Arms are more of intentional devices. People think to reach out for something. It's not, there's no other information that the body can really, uh, we can use out of the body to swing the leg forward, it's like you know, for the arm. So we actually need more intelligent controllers. And also we need to know something about the intention. So to get this intention part, we talk about the brain machine interface. And so it turned out for human brain, as I just said, human brain is nicely organized in a somatotopical way. So if you open the brain and start poking on different areas, they're nicely organized in a certain way. So <laughs> this cartoon basically says, well, isn't that interesting? You, you know, poke in a certain part, and the leg starts moving. So, we take advantage of that, knowing where we can record in the brain from and then stimulate, we might be able to just produce the right behavior. So that's the concept of brain machine interface, that maybe for those people who just had a spinal cord injury, so brain is working, hand is working, but the pathway is broken. We can artificially connect that signal by wires or wireless system, record this signal, Somehow the engineer, engineering has to be done to understand what that means and do the same thing for the sensory system. Take all those sensory s signals and then somehow interpret and stimulate the brain right back again. So this and this is the really interesting part. Um, are spinal cord injuries more common to affect the sensing or the control pathway? Or both? Um, both. But um, it, it's, it's a spinal cord you know, if you slice the spine, um, the motor information tend to go through the inside, and then the sensory information comes from the outside of the spine. So a lot of people used to imagine that if it gets squished or cut, the sensory part is most affected, and the motor part must be preserved. But so it turned out that's not what happens. That so you break a neck, and what happens is that the whole swelling takes place, and the, everything gets really squished. And that's what really kills the nerves. It's not the actual cutting of it. It's mostly the, just the, the pressure of it. So yeah, everything gets affected. Um, OK, so this is really sort of the current state of the art. I think the video might start. I've actually stolen this from a company called Cyberkinetics. This is probably the only company that's out there right now who is approved to implant chips into people's brain. Um, there are only two types of patients that chips are allowed to be implanted on uh, right now. One is um, uh, what we call the locked-in patients. So people whose life is in danger because there's absolutely no way for them to communicate to the external world from any of the motion. So their brain is working fine, but just they can't blink voluntarily. They can't move their fingers voluntarily. So when they're in pain, there's nothing they can do to communicate. Those people, they plan plant the chip, and then they train people so that they can move the cursor up and down on a screen so they can select letters and so forth. And that's one thing they sell and they're able to do to people now. Another is uh, really controlling more of a tremor. So for example, epilepsy and I think Parkinson's are the two areas that people are now allowed to get implants. Again, those people who are so severe that they're just unable to do anything. And it's, again, life-threatening. It has to be life-threatening because the implanting chip has a lot of consequences like infection. So it has to be even you know, worth doing all of that. So 
um, they implant the chip and actually stimulate, the, almost overstimulate the brain, and somehow that calms down their movement. You know, people don't understand exactly what happens, but that's what works, so that's what they're doing. So this company does that, but that's the extent that we can do. Not about movements, we are not talking about anything. So in terms of arm movements, I collaborate with Dr. Schwartz from the University of Pittsburgh, and he probably has the best algorithm out there to control limbs in terms of brain-machine interface. Um, so in the early 80s, from the University of Minnesota, this guy named um, Georgopoulos, I love saying that name, Georgopoulos, um, he figured out that if you record from the motor area of the brain, regardless if it's the leg area, arm area, doesn't matter, they all seem to have, neurons seem to have preferred directions, meaning that if I'm recording from a um, brain that controls arm motion and record from one neuron, when I'm moving my arm to a certain direction, that neuron fires quite a lot, and then if I move to the opposite direction, that neuron is pretty quiet and there seems to be nice tuning toward that direction. And if you record from a neuron next to it, it has yet a totally different preferred direction tuning. So by gathering all those information, and then uh, it's called population coding, if you can record from about 10 neurons all together, or even 100 neurons together, you can gather which direction the arm might be moving. So that's exactly what this uh, um, Dr. Schwartz's group is doing. You can the direction of the end effect. That's right. <laughs> Concerted activity of many different muscles. Yep. So it, it's really, and then people have tried to see is it related to muscles, is it related to joint angles, is it related to the Cartesian coordinates? Um, the answer to all of that is yes, meaning that because all those things are so closely related, there are no ways to really distinguish. And then people who ran very clean experiments to distinguish whether the brain really represents the XYZ coordinate versus the muscle coordinate, they even also found that about 50% of the neurons respond to one and another 50% respond to the other. So the brain seems to have all kinds of representation of different coordinate systems. But regardless, it seems that we can at least get some sort of an endpoint movement direction information. And that's pretty neat. And by integrating it, you can get position. Of course, that has some drift issues, but you know, that's another problem. But at least we're at that point where we can position the hand using, you know, into a certain spot. But now we have to talk about the hand, right? The hand is, oh, actually, I should show you the video. So this is, again, that's, this is something we accomplished this summer. Um, the prosthetic arm is completely controlled by the monkey's brain. And the only thing monkey is thinking is, ooh, I want that piece of orange. And using this population vector of movement directions, it's able to get there and feed itself. So that's pretty good. But that's it. The hand is actually, we're faking the closure of the hand. It's just a you know, state space control in a very simplest mode. It just, if it's at the end, close. If it's like close to the mouth, it's open, and that's it. So the hand is really a big issue. It has lots and lots of degrees of freedom. It has you know, at least 22 degrees of freedom, at least 32 degrees of freedom. Again, another cute fact is that different people have different number of muscles. So we say at least 32. Some people have 33, 34 muscles. Um, and the degree of freedom, too, it's a big controversy. Some people say thumb has four degrees of freedom. Some people say it has 10 degrees of freedom. So it all depends on how you count. And now, you know, given the very, very complicated structure, well, can, we can't really apply this nice directional tuning anymore. It just you know, how are we going to go about all this 22 degrees of freedom of information? We can't really tap into all of that. And even if we did, it may be completely meaningless. So what we really want to do is to see if, you know, we can search for something lower dimension, what we, you know, the neuroscientists like to call primitives or synergy, so that, you know, we can really go into the brain just like how we had the directional information. Um, if we can get to the lower information, well, then with the engineering, we can distribute the signal nicely to the muscles or the motors and you know, control the prosthetics or the paralyzed limbs. Okay, just to display, just to show you how complex this relationship might be, I'll just focus on the index finger alone from here on. This is a robotic device that I built of the um, index finger so that I can, um, rather than using cadaver, to do experiments, now I can display everything on a robotic system if I wanted to really understand how the muscles are contracted and um, forces are transmitted into the finger. 
for index finger, you have three joints in series. The, your knuckle joint can move also side to side, so in total it has four degrees of freedom. That's connected to seven different muscles. And one degree of freedom um, actually have at least three muscles. Lots of muscles cross over different joints. And you know, as you, you know, there's three joints and then a seven muscle problem, uh, sorry, four degrees of freedom and a seven muscle problem is a um, under, um, not under actuated, it's an, a redundant system providing infinite solutions, infinite muscle solutions to achieve a certain posture or a set of torques. So what I mean by it is that if I gave you a certain set of joint torques, I can have this finger really relaxed, or I can have it really tense. So muscle strategies are different, but you don't know by just looking at the joint angles. Okay, so there are infinite solutions to achieve the specific joint angles. So if we wanted to, one, for example, build a prosthetic finger, we don't just care about the joint angles. We also want to have this, you know, the solution to be just like how our brain is controlling it. So how can we really find that the physiological solution in this infinite space? So this is a quick physics review. <laughs> so um, my student always wants me to say this is him. But this is a California governor. And um, so very simple case people have the easiest time relating about muscle is the biceps and triceps. So this is a single jointed system. Biceps makes the arm to go up. Triceps make the arm to go um, extension. Um, what allows this joint torque to occur is the combination of those two muscle forces combined with the moment arm. Okay, so the torque at the joint is a combination of the sum of the force of the muscle times the moment arm. Specifically for this case, whatever the bicep produced times the moment arm minus the triceps force times the moment arm produces this force to curl the arm. I can map that onto the force force space so this gray box is bounded by a minimum and maximum force of those two muscles. And simply by doing calculation of engineering, if I wanted to know, if I wanted this joint to produce a certain set torque, I know that it has to lie along this blue line. That's an isotorque line. And by, again, by simple engineering solution, I can calculate this minimum solution, what we call F star, required to produce this torque. But we also know that physiologically, we don't actually use this solution, but we use something along this line to produce this torque somewhere a little bit away. Okay, so we call this the minimum force solution, and we call this the physiologic solution. Okay, now this is a, this is a specific like case. It's a one time slice, one time instant situation and one joint and one and just two simple sets of muscles. But the moment we increase it to a more dynamic situation, even if it's discretized, you have now we're gonna move along the space. You know, we produce different torques over time. So this blue line goes up and down in this space. And also we actually change the amount, the difference from the minimum to the physiologic solution back and forth. So now maybe over time it goes from F1, F2, F3, F4, F4 and so forth. And so far, I've been only telling you one joint, two muscle situations, but what if we had three muscles? Now, rather than graphing it in a two-dimensional sense, we have to graph this in a three-dimensional sense because now we're talking about three muscles. What used to be the gray box on the plane becomes a gray box or gray cube um, in a space. And what used to be an isotorque line now becomes an isotorque plane. Okay, just one dimensional higher and everything. And we can still have the F star minimum solution, and we can still have this physiologic solution both on the plane. Now, if we actually then inc include another joint, still three muscles, so still within this gray box, but now we're going to have a yet another isotorque plane. Those two planes intersect, produce a line. And now, for three muscles, two joint situation, we again have a line with a minimum solution and some physiologic solution. So forth, so forth. For an index finger, I said it has four degrees of freedom and seven muscles. Now we have this thing that I don't know how to represent on this slide. 
some sort of a seven-dimensional force graph. If you can come up with a way, I would have a great figure in my journal paper, so let me know. Um, so seven-dimensional force space bounding by all those different minimum and maximum forces. And um, now just you know, by using null space, we can um, calculate exactly what the minimum force uh, situation is and then a physiological solution. Now, what we're really after, again, just going back to the first slide I started talking about the brain-machine interface, is that we want to find some lower dimensional representation that brain might care about. You know, it's really calculating all those seven force, forces every single time, every little second. That seems like way too much work for the brain. We can't, we don't want to go finding it. But if we talked about just this one single vector information, maybe that's something pretty easy to understand, seem, very simple thing to look for in the brain. And a lot of neuroscientists, so turned out, believe that what we control is something like impedance or stiffness, or what we call this as a co-contraction, of the amount of co-contraction that, you know, it's a two muscles pulling each other, really tight information. So if it's that simple, that would be really nice. So that's really what we went after. This is a box diagram to show how we go about finding this F star and then, um, then the F tilde. This figure is an old one, unfortunately. It doesn't have everything on it. Um, but what we do is we actually record the joint angles as people move around in the space. At the same time, we record muscle signals from every muscle, so seven muscles of the index finger, as all four degrees of freedom are moving. By differentiating and then sticking it into Newton-Euler method, which allows, it's basically like um, a human finger dynamic model in the inverse kinematic sense, allows you to get the torque signal. So for joint torques that would produce all this acceleration, velocity, and position, we can calculate for that accurately using this Newton-Euler method. This is a robotic method. It's really nice. OK. Now, we actually said that from four torque information going to the seven force signal is a one-to-many mapping. We can't go there. So this line actually stops right here. We can't go any further. But from the muscles, we record muscle signals. We rectify and do all the smoothing stuff. And then here's we actually go through optimization functions to switch it into what we call a muscle activation signal, pass it through a model of the muscle, which turns this activation signal into muscle force. Then simply multiplying the moment arm, we can get the torque. We can compare a difference. If the error is big, we iterate on this optimization function. OK, so now, even though we can't go directly from this torque to this force, by comparing the error and then optimizing on those parameters, we can get this force to um, um, represent these torques. Okay. Now, by doing so, we can find what people seem to be using as the physiological truth, um, truth force data. I'm sure I've lost you all by now. <laughs> no, but OK. But so now, recording from muscles, recording from joint angles, we can get the, what the muscles are using for force information. We can also simply, by going this route, and then calculating the minimum force, we can get the F star information. By taking that difference, as I said, if that information seems to be something that's a constant for a given task, that would be really nice. And so far, what we've been finding is that, indeed, it seems to be a constant um, for some sort of subject um, executing a task. Actually, we give a spring squishing task. People are doing this over and over. The whole time we're measuring this vector called co-contraction vector, and this vector is in a seven-dimensional space, so we have, again, no way to make this in a really, really pretty figure. But this is the, the head of the, um, the vector is the blue dot. After subjects executed this movement for, I think this is 64 movements overlaying on top of each other. And at least you can see the take-home message on this slide is that all those blue dots lie on top of each other. So it seems that maybe we're actually getting to some lower dimensional information that the brain may be actually caring about. Even though the motion itself, the joint angles are varying every single time. It's not exactly the same every time. If you look at the velocity, nothing seems to be constant. Yet 
we look at this cold contraction vector and there's something very consistent about it. So one of the things now we're doing is if we can find this vector in the monkey brain. So now we're going back and doing so. And I'm going to now end my talk by showing you this robotic finger that I've built, which is controlled by this F star signal and F tilde signal. So this finger is a human size, as you can see. What I did was I moved my finger in a kind of random way, and I gave this video to my student and said, OK, given those joint angles, figure out a way for the robot to move exactly in the same way. So the idea was, again, use that diagram I've shown you to calculate the F star, which is the minimum cold contraction state to move the robot, versus using exactly the same situation the muscle force that I've used for my finger to move this way and then control this robotic finger. And both, of course, resulted in the same movement. So that's called the inversion problem. Given, given the motion, you want to invert to estimate what the force looks like. Mm -hmm. The point is, it's not, there's no unique solution. There's no unique solution. So any possible force could give you the same kind of motion. Yeah. That's correct. That's At least theoretically, that's correct. So if that were the case, why do you bother so much to find F star? You may just choose arbitrary one, uh, the straight force that sure. give you the same solution. Okay. Why is so, it the right solution? Okay. So there are two answers to that I can give you. One, people seem to, so it's the same thing. Why does the biology care to not pick that minimum solution or you know, just one solution? Who cares? But somehow biology happens to pick a very unique solution. I mean, that's interesting enough. But um, the answer seems to be that people are always ready for some perturbation. So people are doing some things, and then you know there's some perturbation that comes comes across. If we're operating in a complete minimum sense, the finger would just break off because it's unable to to compensate for that. So it seems that there seems to people have some level of co-contraction of the muscles. At least the breaking off is a theory that maybe that's why the biology does it the way it does. But that's one way. Another is that when we actually put the minimum solution to the robotic finger, we found that the robot doesn't move very smoothly. We haven't quite figured out why. But once we figure it out, maybe it's going to again tell us some insight about why we don't use this minimum solution as the biological solution. And on, on this robot, we tried to model the joint shapes and the way the tendons rub over as physiologically accurate as you could. Yeah, so that's the 20 slides that I cut out. Um, basically, it's, it's been a very fascinating project. That I got together with two hand surgeons, and um, we said, OK, well, we really want to understand about human finger bio you know, hand biomechanics. And you know we would like to build a model of that in hardware, not software, because we eventually would like to have this as a prosthetic device. So yeah, we initially build. Do you remember this weird slide that I had with? Uh, let me see if I can find that. Look like a Halloween hand. Here you go. So initially, when I started this project, I got together with um, so the two hand surgeons and the guy whose title is animatronicist. He, um, he's from Hollywood, and he built like Jurassic Park dinosaurs and so forth. And then we got together and said, let's build as many anatomical structures so that we can mimic given current material science. And let's build it and see if we can use this for medical student teaching tool and even as a preoperative planning tool for hand surgeons. So we went and built it, and then came up with something that looks really like a Halloween costume. And it worked really well. An art student that I had took it and then it had, it typed the keyboard in the museum for six weeks, eight to four every day, and then it worked just fine, which is very amazing. But by the end of the six weeks, those joints start to get really stiff. And then I got hand surgeons to evaluate the hand and said, sorry, it has gotten arthritis. So um, then we found out that, well, human joints are pretty amazing, that it has this synovial fluid, which you know, cell death happens and the cell replacement happens. But for the robotic system, none of the cells are being replaced. So they got old and a little hard, and that was it. So we said, well, obviously, certain materials we can mimic, certain materials we cannot mimic. Um, so how can we really go about understanding it? Um, and, what, and we actually then went to very traditional robotic-like looking finger, cylindrical bone shape with the tendons still preserved. Um, then we found out that well, the bone shape, this funny bumps and everything, actually does matter because that determines the moment arm 
of the, the tendons traveling. So we had to preserve the shape of the bones, and then, but the joint structure, we, you know, we couldn't preserve the exact nice fluid system encased in that. So we actually have a pretty well-designed system, um, nice um, joint mechanism, which is an enclosed um, gimbal system. So that, this finger, so you know you can see the bones are made of now aluminum hollowed out to have the mass to be exactly the same as the human bone. Um, the joint mechanism is all oh, enclosed in here, but no longer there's any fluid inside. It's actually just like a little robotic finger mechanism, just that it's a little bit improved and so that it doesn't in interfere with the tendon movement. Tendon materials made of nylon um, composite, which mimics the, ten the human tendon stress strain curve. Um, Let's see, what else did we mimic? Obviously, the, the whole routing structure is the same. Uh, force vector is the same. At the end, that what's pulling is the motor, which is mimicking the muscle spring, um, passive spring um, properties. Which are up in your forearm? Your... Uh, we have, for index finger, we actually have three muscles within the, the palm, and then four of them in the forearm. So is there any experimental verification to show that uh, whatever force that you estimate is close to the real force that controls your, your movement there. So our validation, only the validation we've got is to display in a robotic system and show that indeed it produces movements very similar to it. They are, there's nobody who were actually able to go into every muscle and be able to record the forces. So, don't so, so we don't know. Different That's kind of force that might produce the same kind of movement. That's Sorry? different force sort of oh, pattern that may produce the same kind of movement. Sure. Didn't happen. Oh, so can we valid, uh, validate that what we call the physiologic solution is oh, so indeed the physiologic correct. solution? Yeah, we can't yeah. really validate. Um, there are people who have done incredibly invasive experiments to do this. Um, so so I, I wonder, but, do you know whether people do similar kind of experiment for the time movement? Because when we, at one time we do speech recognition mm -hmm. here, we are considering similar kind of model. Okay. It's the low dimensional force that controls the time, therefore you can produce the right sound. Okay. And I, it looks like uh, the finger movement is more delicate, like a 22 degree of freedom. Uh -huh. Rest, I think most of the time that we look at before is only about 8 or 9 degrees. Okay. So in the literature, is this finger movement supposed to be more, maybe most delicate movement among the whole human body? Uh, I mean, as a whole hand it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, tongue is, I don't even know how to classify how many degrees of freedom we have in there. Seven or eight, yeah. Well, so it's almost similar to eight or so muscles controlling seven or so degrees of freedom. Mm. But the, pain, the problem there is that you could produce similar kind of position in the tongue, but you might use different kind of muscle. So it, it, the same problem is that there is sure. no unique solution there. Right. Um, so, if you, but if you record from all every muscle on your tongue, I can probably tell you theoretically what I think you might be using. Okay. But there is a forward solution that is unique. Once the force is given, you know exactly the shape it is. Mm -hmm. But given the force, but given right. the shape, you may have different solutions. Right. So but I think in engineering solutions that what we have, typically we look for the dynamics. If mm -hmm. you can produce the entire curve, sure. then the solution, you know, quite likely to become unique. So I don't uh, know the significant kind of problem here. I see. So by having the time sequence, sequence. the only way to make a smooth motion has to be yeah. using the physiologic yeah, solution. It has to be that. That's uh, for, we thought the, we thought something very similar for the hand, the finger, but that we still couldn't eliminate it to a single solution. We still had a, quite a lot of solutions that we can really distinguish. Yeah. So that's. One of the things that's so hard because we can't record, go into the muscle and then put a force transducer on every single muscle, which we would love to do, but nobody has volunteered for that so far. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Here. Great, yeah, thank you.